Hey everyone, these are all the animated stories from 2019, so I hope you enjoy watching them. Olivia and her fiancé threw a dinner party one time to celebrate his mom completing chemo. She hired a caterer and they were expecting 25 friends and family. The caterer said he'd bring everything 75% done, but he needed to finish off some dishes in their kitchen. She told him that was fine as long as he finished by 5. He arrived as scheduled at 12 p.m., but the moment he entered the house, Olivia noticed that he had a disgusting smell. That made her uneasy because he was going to be preparing food for sick prior and young kids. She just made sure he washed his hands and then left him to his own devices, worrying she was just being presumptuous. The entire time, he kept asking her about the seasoning of the food and telling her to taste it. She said, you're the chef, so I trust you. You don't have to keep asking me. Fast forward, he was still there at 5.45. The guests were arriving, so after two gentle reminders, she flat out told him she needed him completely out by 6 no matter what. He apologized and said there had been a delay because Olivia's oven wouldn't stay up to temperature. She never had a problem with her oven before, but figured he's the professional, so maybe it was a subtle problem? He gets his bags and packs everything up, but suddenly heads towards her bedroom. Olivia's completely taken aback and says, Excuse me, where are you going? And he says, to change. She tells him she's not comfortable with him going in her room and there's a restroom to do that. But he insisted it will only take a second and goes in and shuts and locks the door. Olivia couldn't even get a word out before he went in and felt helpless. At this point, her fiancé had come back home, so she explained the situation to him. Confused as to what was going on, he pounds on the door, telling the caterer to come out. The man opens the door, wearing a t-shirt and jeans. Her fiancé said, You shouldn't be in there. You need to leave. The caterer responded and said, Excuse me, but this is not your house. It's not up to you to decide. Yes, actually, it is. My fiancé lives here with me. Suddenly, the caterer goes nuts. He turns to her and screams, You lied to me! Olivia had no clue what he was talking about. He starts yelling about how she led him on and blurting nonsense, calling her disgusting names. He then goes in the kitchen and starts throwing the food out of the refrigerator and onto the floor. Without hesitating, the fiancé and his two brothers forced him to leave the house immediately. Thankfully, the party then went on as planned. But Olivia insisted they just order pizza and throw out all the food he made. After partying, they went out late drinking with his brothers and got home at around 3.30 a.m. and passed out in their room. And then, at around 5 a.m., Olivia was woken up to the sound of the door opening. Olivia wakes up her fiancé and whispers, I think someone just came in the house. He said, probably my brother left his wallet or something. Olivia figured she's being paranoid when suddenly a loud crash came from outside the room. He told her to lock herself in the closet and call 911 while he went out and looked around. As she was pulling out her phone, they hear, Olivia! Hello? And she realizes that insane caterer. She went outside and saw the man shirtless and clearly on something. He lunges towards Olivia and her fiancé stops him while she called the police. He tells them the cops have been called and it would be in his best interest for him to get off the property. The caterer says, I have to make sure Olivia's okay. Her fiancé stayed between them while she climbed out the window. He even thought of taking the gun out of the safe. The caterer began to destroy their kitchen and when the cops finally came in, they see that he has a knife on him. He didn't obey police's orders to drop his weapon so they chased him. As he's being let out in handcuffs, he's shouting out how he and Olivia are in love. The police ask to do an inventory of the house and see if anything's missing or damaged besides what they witnessed him do. They went around, but saw nothing. But then, Olivia remembered that he was in her room. She quickly checked and found out that all her panties were gone. They were so freaked out in the aftermath that they replaced all kitchenware and they had a cleaning crew do a deep clean on the whole house. Olivia was so glad that she decided not to serve the food to the guests, especially her fiancé's fragile mother. 
The caterer sent a letter from prison and thankfully her husband intercepted because she was still recovering from the whole thing. They gave it to the police who helped issue a no contact order. He was sent to three years in prison and thankfully Olivia and her family never saw him again. A week before Kim's 10th birthday, she walked to the corner store with a $5 bill and picked up a jar of ragu for her mom. On her way home, a man she'd never seen before began talking. Hi, he said cheerfully. My name is Dr. Ramsey. I'm a pediatrician. Do you know what a pediatrician is? Kim walked along silently, not replying and fervently hoping he would take that as a sign he should leave her alone. I was just on my way to get some lollipops for the candy jar in my office. What's your name? Thankfully, they were nearing her house, so she ran forward and went inside. Kim didn't know it then, but that was the beginning of a very long and very scary ordeal. It didn't take long after that for Dr. Ramsey to begin showing up. He would drive by nearly every day smiling and waving. Kim told her mom, who said maybe it was on his way home from work. But then the phone calls began. Kim's dad asked about the day Dr. Ramsey followed her home and if she talked to him. He said she wasn't in trouble but that she needed to tell him the truth. Kim told him no, and he asked if she was sure or if she could be forgetting something. She said no again, and he frowned, then asked, Then how does he know your name? Kim didn't know. It turns out that was not all he knew. He knew her sister's name as well. Neither Kim nor her sister were allowed to answer the phone, and he called several times a day. Then one night, one of Kim's brothers told them that he was telling their parents that he was going to hurt her, and later, her sister. Things got complicated after that. Kim's dad called the police, but as this was before there were any stalking laws, there was not a lot they could do. They told the parents to call back if he tried anything. Kim's dad then called a friend of his who happened to be a cop. For the next month, her dad's friend escorted her to and from school. She couldn't go outside alone anymore. Then one afternoon, all the siblings and their mom were in the kitchen, when all of a sudden, one of the brothers saw a glimpse of someone in the garage. Dr. Ramsey came bolting out of it and the brother chased after him. They ran all the way to Cherokee Park where he lost him in the trees. Kim's parents called the police again, but nothing came out of it. The only information they had was a description and a name that was almost certainly fake. A couple weeks later, the family woke up to something horrific happen to their German Shepherd. The cops said there was no evidence it was him and ruled it accidental, but none of them believed that. His phone calls became more informative in the meantime. That night, the dad put in some carpenter nails in the bottom of the French doors until he got a new lock ordered. Her parents had to go to a company event for her dad's work and the older brother was at a skating event so only the three younger ones were home. Suddenly the top of the French door swung inward and in a few milliseconds before the nails in the bottom caused them to snap back, Kim could see his silhouette. The sisters crept down to the brother's room to look. Someone was standing at the back door knocking loudly. What do you want? She said. Is this the Mercy residence? I have a pizza for delivery. She scoffed at him, declaring she was not stupid and she was calling the cops. Before they knew it, he left. A short while later, her brother returned home. Kim told him what happened and he walked around the yard watching for him. By now, the family had pretty much given up calling the cops because it never helped. As the younger brother was in the kitchen, he had this sensation that he was being watched. He stepped closer, then closer again until he was right up to the door. There on the other side of the window was Dr. Ramsey smiling back at him. He turned to yell for his older brother but when he looked back again, he was gone. They went out again to look for him but didn't see him anywhere. A week later, Kim was at school and the kids were outside on the playground during recess. She was swinging upside down when she saw that familiar blue car cruising by, moving slowly. There he was, smiling and waving. He called her name and Kim ran to the teacher and told her. 
The school had been told all about him and the teacher took her inside right away and called Kim's mom. That same day, her mom had gotten a call from the school office asking her to verify that Kim's dad was picking her up as he called to say that he was on his way. He wasn't. Not long after that, Kim woke up one night thirsty. She went down to the kitchen for a drink and there, sitting alone in the dark, was her dad. On the table was a gun. He was tired of being afraid every time he left for work that something would happen to his kids while he was gone. Kim sat with him for a time, watching, before he sent her back to bed. Then, as suddenly as it began, it was over. He had vanished from their lives. The phone calls, the drive-by and creepy waves, everything. For a long time during and after the Dr. Ramsey incident, she would have a recurring nightmare in which she would wake up to find him standing over her as she slept. It took a long time before Kim felt like a kid again. She still wonders if the wait had ended for her dad when he was waiting in the darkened kitchen that one night. Kim doesn't know, and she's not sure that she wants to. When I was nine, I usually got home from school about an hour before my mom got home from work. I lived super close, so she figured it was fine. I did the usual thing, which was to make sure I locked the front door and double check that the back door leading to the patio was also locked. I played as much PlayStation as possible in my room before my mom came home and made me do homework. But on this particular day while playing, I heard this noise coming from outside my window. It was kind of like the sound of a cat, but my cat had been missing for over three months. Hope struck and I thought maybe he finally came back. I ran downstairs to check but to my surprise there was a guy standing on my patio. It was a tall man with black hair covering half of his eyes. I could hear him making high pitched sounds almost like a cat meowing. A brown liquid was running down from his mouth and I could see him spitting out my dad's stomp cigarettes. He was actually eating from the ashtray. I screamed so loud that the man must have heard it. He didn't react. He just kept on eating from the ashtray. I ran upstairs to my room and called my mom who then called the cops, laying in my bed under my sheets, shivering with fear. The next thing I remember is the police arriving on the road by my yard. I hear them talking to the guy. The high-pitched sound was more frequent and louder. I decided to look through the window feeling safe now that the cops were there. The man suddenly charged the female police officer with full force and he knocked her out cold. The male officer then immediately tased the guy and handcuffed him. One of my neighbors made me come down and she took care of me until my mom came back home. The police took the creepy guy with them in the car and left. The male officer came back later that night and sat down with me and my mom to talk. He explained that the guy on my patio was actually diagnosed with severe autism. He had escaped the facility where mentally challenged people lived, located around 5 kilometers from where my house was. He explained that the guy had actually been living in my house 5 years ago, but he had been forced to move when his mom, his only caretaker, died. The poor guy probably thought he would find his mom in this house. He missed the routines and he missed living there with his mom. The police had to move him from the house that time 5 years ago. This was the reason he reacted the way he did when the police came that day. Still frightened, I told the police officer that he needed to make sure that this would never happen again, and he promised it wouldn't. After a few sleepless nights, my life got back to normal. The years went by and the guy didn't come back. At this time, my mom and dad had moved out. I bought the house from them and I'm still living here till this day. I was enjoying my morning coffee on the patio when I see this random guy stopping on the road by my fence. He just stands there looking at me. I look at him and give him a nod, and then I hear the high-pitched noises. His hair had turned gray, but the high-pitched sounds made me realize. My heart started racing and I instantly remembered the reason why he was back. I realized that he must have managed to escape again. 16 years later and he was back to look for his mom. I decided to carefully ask him if he wanted to come down to the patio. He instantly jumped the fence and I started to think he would knock me out like he did to that police officer, but he didn't. He looked at me and smiled. We went inside and his face lit up with pure joy. He was home. It reminded him of the life he had with his mom. All of a sudden, he sat down on my couch, turned on the TV, and switched directly to the cartoons. I just wanted to enjoy the moment so I didn't say anything to him. But I realized I had to call the facility to let them know. The caretakers arrived 10 minutes later. After a lot of convincing, he got back up 
and they went back to the facility. Two days later, I caught them again and we made a deal. His name is Tom, and I now consider Tom my friend. Every Sunday from the day he returned, Tom and his caretakers visit me to watch cartoons. They say it's the highlight of his week. For several years, I was very afraid of the guy on my patio eating from the ashtray. But now my thoughts are, Tom, let's meet every Sunday to watch cartoons together. When I was about six years old, my mom started taking my sister and I to Dr. Daniel's dental office. The dental center was located inside a giant yellow mansion that also doubled as his house. When my sister and I got caught in, my mom followed us into the office until she was told by Dr. Daniels that parents weren't allowed to be with their children as it taught kids independence, to which my mom complied to. Growing up, I had bad anxiety and selective mutism, so the moment we all separated, I cried because I was so scared. Dr. Daniels did not like the crying, so he grabbed me and put his hands over my mouth and nose and shook me and told me to stop crying and scaring the other kids. His hygienist Judy came over and told me if I continued to cry, she would spank me. All I wanted was my mom next to me, but I knew that if I wanted to get out, I just had to act like I was not terrified. After the first appointment, my sister and I told my mom that we were scared of the dentist, but she just took it as me being an anxious child, so we continued to see him. Each visit was just as terrifying. Every time we went to the dentist, Dr. Daniels, or the Tooth Man as he called himself, always had us have heavy dental procedures done. We had sealants done on several baby teeth and plenty of teeth removed, some with his fingers with no regards to pain at all. He would leave us there with the retractor on for about 45 minutes or so before he came to work on our teeth. Sometimes he would eat his lunch while we sat there with our mouth open. Probably one of the worst pains I've ever felt in my life. There was one time in the third grade I was in so much pain waiting I couldn't take it. I sat up on a chair and tried to scream and cry as loud as I could. Dr. Daniels came rushing over angry and he screamed at me for being a big baby and scaring the other kids. I was so sad at myself because I hadn't cried in so long. He then took me back to my dental chair and then pinned me down to the seat in a straitjacket. He put my retractors back on and said that I would have to wait longer because I caused such a scene. Afterwards, my mouth would become so swollen and filled with rashes. It hurt to talk for days. He would often tell my mother I was a difficult patient if I so much as winced at his torture. When I was in seventh grade, I started getting braces, so I went to see an orthodontist. We stopped seeing Dr. Dan and I had a new dentist who was actually nice. I never known that getting your teeth clean didn't have to feel like going through a saw trap. I think my mom took us out of Dr. Dan's practice when the orthodontist looked at our dental records and saw a lot of unnecessary procedures being done on our mouths. Not long ago, I was having a conversation with a friend about our childhood fears and instantly my mind went to the tooth man. Curious, I googled him and to my happiness, the practice was shut down. Also left under his name was a Yelp page that was still up. The page was filled with numerous one-star reviews from former patients that were once abused as kids in his office. Their experiences were so close and some identical as to what I went through. A lot of the procedures Dr. Dan did were just a scam for him to collect money off our parents' insurance. And now that I think about it, he was probably so adamant of us not crying and screaming for help because he didn't want parents to hear and come and see what was going on. It's hard not to blame your parents in this situation, but the truth is this man was a swift abuser. For every bruise and swell, he would have dental explanations that would make my parents feel stupid for asking. I don't blame my mom for not believing us, and eventually she did come around. To any parents watching this, if you're ever told to not go in with your child to an appointment, something's definitely not right. 15 years ago, Emma had the misfortune of meeting Dave. She was new to riding the bus to school and didn't happen to know anyone, so she sat by herself. She could feel someone was watching her from behind, 
So she turned a couple times to look, and that's when she saw Dave. He had brown curly hair and turned away every time she caught him staring. He told Emma she had nice hair and he liked her t-shirt. He asked right off the bat if she would be his girlfriend. Emma said absolutely not. She didn't even know him and his creepy staring made her uncomfortable. Well, Emma had pointed him out to a few people in school and everyone she talked to said he was the nicest person they'd ever met and just a bit of an odd duck. Next thing she knows, Dave had joined her photography class and after school programs. She saw him around every corner and in every hallway of the school. He started popping up to try and hug Emma and tickle her. When she found out he was telling people he was her boyfriend, Emma knew she needed to put her foot down. He kept asking for hugs and she refused. And that's when things took a turn. Suddenly, anonymous notes were popping up in Emma's locker. Most of the notes said, always, and nothing else. Some had longer declarations of love. The simplicity of the message gave her chills, and it had to be Dave. Her suspicions were confirmed when pictures of herself began showing up along with the notes. The pictures were all taken from a slight distance, and she finally got scared. One Sunday afternoon, as Emma was watching TV in her bed, she heard Dave's voice next to the bedroom window. He said he watched her walk home one day to see where she lived and wanted to stop by for a visit. He said he knew she wouldn't let him in, so he figured he'd just stop by the window to talk. He quickly left, but now it got serious and adults needed to be involved. Emma's mom thought she was exaggerating. She acknowledged the notes and pictures as weird, but nothing other than a serious infatuation. So, Emma went to Mr. K who also had Dave as a student and noticed some of his obsessive behavior and didn't doubt her story for a moment. He spoke to Dave's guidance counselor and they both sat down with him, telling him that he was making Emma uncomfortable and to stop. This angered Dave. He stormed up to her in the lobby of the school with a glass rose in his hand and threw it at the wall behind her. He screamed in Emma's face about how she had broken his heart just like the rose. Mr. K had to break up the situation, and a few days later, he dropped out of school and Emma went eight years without seeing Dave. Emma was craving some mac and cheese one day and hit up a popular spot in town to grab some to go. She looked behind the counter and... There's Dave. Emma had no idea he was working there and debated leaving for a moment. Middle school was so long ago and she hadn't heard from him since that day in the lobby. Surely this guy cannot still have this obsession with Emma. It was a huge relief when another register opened and a young woman took her order. She wondered if he was even mortified and didn't want to interact. Well, Dave seemed to take Emma's visit as a sign that she was ready to love him. Emma got a friend request from him that night and immediately deleted it. A few nights later, she's getting home and walking on the street when she sees that someone is standing on the side of her house. She gets into the house quickly, locks everything, and watches. And then she sees him, his curly brown hair. Emma called the police and reported this, but of course, there wasn't much they could do. There was no proof, and he hadn't approached her or tried to get in. They did agree to keep someone on lookout in the area, and she had police patrolling more than usual the following nights. But eventually, the police patrol died down, and that's when the late night knocking began. She could hear it softly on windows and occasionally on the back door, but never dared to answer or get close enough to look. It wasn't every night, maybe two or three nights a week. The police never seemed to be close enough in the area when it happened so they couldn't catch him. A couple weeks after the knocking began, Emma received an envelope wedged into the screen door, full of the creepy candid pictures from middle school and another note that said, Always. She had enough and wanted to have some official record of what was happening. And that's when Emma saw the word, Always carved into her car's back bumper. Emma lost it, and in her rage, she took a picture of the police station sign and the report being filed and sent them over to Dave over Facebook. And she told him to leave her alone, that the police were involved and things will only get worse if he continues. 
and to her surprise, he simply responded, You're right. And just like that, he disappeared. Was the mac and cheese worth it? Definitely not. And ever since that day, Emma never saw Dave again. Back when Sarah was 17, she worked at a small local bakery. There were less than 15 employees spread across all the night and day shifts, so they only had a few people working during the day. One of these people was Dave, the delivery driver. From the first time they met, Dave immediately gave Sarah an off vibe. He was in his mid-50s and way too friendly to a teenage girl. But the boss told her that yes, he could be annoying, but no one worked harder than he did, so just ignore his antics. Sarah then recalled that when she signed the paperwork, they never asked her to submit a background check. And in hindsight, that should have been red flag number two. Over the course of the year or so that she worked with Dave, Sarah tried very hard to ignore him. He was rarely outright creepy, but he was always just a bit too friendly. He would stick around long after his shift was over to talk to her and another pastry chef. He always wanted to lick the bowl after she finished making Rice Krispie treats. He would always stand in front of the racks or equipments or ingredients just enough that sometimes her hand would brush him while reaching for something. Dave always stood just a little too close. Dave was constantly asking Sarah about her life, what she liked, what she did for fun, if she had a boyfriend. Almost daily, he would tell her how a nice girl like her should have a boyfriend, how maybe a boyfriend would be good for her. Sarah let this slide because sometimes older people can say things that were meant differently in their time. But then it was the concert invites. Every other week he had tickets to one concert or another. Once he figured out Sarah's favorite genre of music, it was almost exclusively tickets to bands she desperately wanted to see. But she also knew that she should not go anywhere with him. Then her birthday came. He bought her a t-shirt and it was two sizes too small. He told her to try it on after work and text him a photo and proceeded to give Sarah his phone number. He didn't ask for her number. She said no. He asked the other pastry chef for her number, but she had her back and refused as well. He also brought two tickets from another band that Sarah had been wanting to see. VIP section, 21 plus only. He said he could get her in. She just had to go with him and him alone. This continued for a while. Sarah brought it up to one of her bosses, but they laughed it off as, oh, classic Dave. When he wanted a hug on his birthday and hugged her without consent, there's Dave for you. Offering to get her booze or pot, oh, Dave, you scamp. When he pulled up his shirt and showed his abdominal scar from a snowboarding accident, well, that's just Dave. No respect for boundaries, but he was a good worker. Sarah even considered having one of her big strong male friends come in under the guise of being her boyfriend just to placate Dave. She was repulsed by him, but he hadn't really done anything to classify himself as a predator. Besides asking for her number, he had never tried to straight up harass her, and besides the odd hug or two that she was too shy and afraid to refuse, he hadn't gotten super physical. Then one day, Dave was gone. His name disappeared from the employee roster. Sarah's boss asked to see her in the office. She informed her that Dave was no longer employed at their business. Dave had been fired. He was fired because Dave was a convicted sex offender. There is one count kidnapping a minor from the mid-90s and another count that she doesn't want to think about. They had never background checked him, and when they contacted a friend in the police department, they found out that Dave had been lying on lots of paperwork hiding the fact that he was a convicted felon and not notifying anyone when he moved. Once they brought this information to the police department's attention, they had a few more charges to add. They found out because apparently he had been stalking and harassing one of the clients he delivered to. After his termination, Dave showed up to work one day. He had a weapon with him, but Sarah never found out what he had. They told him to leave or the police would be called, and he ended up leaving in handcuffs. Sarah was extremely relieved that she wasn't there that day. It's been a while since she worked at the bakery, but sometimes she still thinks about how badly things could have gotten had she gone to even one of those concerts with him. 
Pevin had just turned 21, so he and his friend decided to go to a bar one night and was approached by a cute girl named Candice. He didn't know if she was just trying to get free drinks by flirting, so he told her that they didn't have much money. However, Candice was the one who offered and she kept buying more and more. Kevin started getting confused as to who she liked more between him and David and why she was being so generous. A little later, they both carried David out the bar. She kept telling him to go home with her, but he was so out of it he could barely answer. Kevin told her that he couldn't let him go anywhere as he didn't want David to wake up in a random house without a car and not remembering what happened. Candace kept pushing it, saying that she would take care of him, but Kevin told her that the only way David was going anywhere was if he tagged along. Immediately, she started flirting with Kevin and offered to get his friend a taxi and said they could drive to her place alone. At this point, Kevin had a few drinks and was pretty buzzed, so he agreed. They got David a taxi to go home and the two walked to Candace's car. Everything was happening so quickly and he started feeling uneasy. They got in the car and she drove the street when she asked if he wanted to stop at the store and get some more to drink. Kevin wanted to be able to carry himself throughout the rest of the night, so he declined. He did find Candace attractive and he didn't want to seem lame, so he told her to get a pint with some apple juice to chase it. She went in the store and came out with a lot more than just a pint. Kevin assumed that she wanted to drink as well, but throughout the car ride, Candace kept telling him to drink more and more. He somehow managed to drink all the juice, so he pretended to drink the bottle by spitting the liquor in the apple juice container. He then tossed the apple juice out the window before she could see it and just drank a little more from the remaining bottle. Kevin was able to make her believe he was actually drunk, but in reality, he was simply buzzed. They drove up to her house and he pretended to trip and stumble so she helped him walk inside. The front door was unlocked, but she made sure it was locked when they got in. Kevin thought that was strange, but he didn't think too much of it, so he told her that he had to use the bathroom. He walked inside and looked at himself in the mirror. He just felt strange. There was definitely something off. He turned on the sink to make noise and made himself puke up the liquor he drank. Kevin flushed and went to the sink and started drinking the tap water to sober up. He just didn't want to be drunk, but still wanted to hook up with Candace. Kevin turned the sink off when he suddenly heard her talking to someone outside. He's drunk as hell. He could barely stand up. You do it. Who was she talking to? And do what? Kevin walked out the bathroom, and the moment he stepped into the living room, he saw Candace walking into another room. That strange, very bright red hair. He didn't see her face or anything. Uh, hey, where are you going? She walked back into the dark living room and up to Kevin and said, Let's go in my room. He looked at her bright red hair and into her eyes. They were different. Her face was different. It was another girl with the same hair. And that's when Kevin realized it was another girl with the same wig on. It was a wig the entire time. Kevin's heart felt like it stopped but he tried to look like he had no idea it was a different girl. Kevin kind of smiled and told her that he just needed to use the bathroom one more time and told her he was sorry he was so drunk. She said, it's fine, just hurry up in there. Kevin went into the bathroom and locked the door. He heard her whispering something to someone again, this time thinking that he heard a male voice whisper back. Something sketchy was going on and he had to get out of the house. Kevin opened the bathroom window and jumped straight out of it and ran faster than he ever had in his life. Now looking back, he kept running down the main road until he saw CVS and stood straight at the front of the store in front of the camera. Kevin then called a taxi and went home. He tried thinking about what happened that night. She kept buying him and his friend drinks and even paid for David's friend's taxi cab. And most of all, why did she wear a wig that she gave to another girl to wear? Who was she talking to? And what was in that room that they tried to lure him into? Jane had been in Korea for the semester as part of her major in university. She wanted to have some sort of romantic experience in Korea, and her friend recommended her to use a dating app to meet English-speaking Koreans. That way she could meet someone and experience the dating culture. About three weeks later, she met a guy named Tim on the app. He eagerly wanted to meet for a date. And he seemed nice, but she should have asked more questions, and he didn't give many details about himself. Tim was a guy a bit older than her, and claimed he was a college student. Jane assumed he had done his military time and returned to school. He wanted to come to her place originally to pick her up, but Jane lived in an all-women's dorm and didn't want him to know exactly where she lived since they were still strangers. 
So instead, she insisted they meet at the main town center near the subway. Tim really didn't like this idea, which looking back was a red flag, but she insisted. The night of the day, Jane waited an hour for this guy. Why was he so late, she thought. Tim weirdly claimed that he just wanted to make her wait. She thought he was kidding and messaged him a laughing emoji assuming he was just lost. When he finally arrived, he was much smaller than she thought. But a man's height was never something she cared much about. He was also quite thin. Maybe Jane let her guard down because she didn't see him as physically threatening. Right off the bat, he was way too touchy and breathed creepily and heavily. Jane was so off put with his demeanor and felt odd about the situation. Then, the first thing he said to her was, you're not as white as I thought you were. Jane thought this was a translation error, but his English was near perfect. So she asked him for clarification, and he said, I thought you would be more white. Are you pure European? Now she was officially weirded out. Why does he care in the first place anyway? Why does her skin color matter to this guy? He kept talking about how he wished the color of her eyes were darker, but then she brushed it off as him being nervous and trying to start a conversation. When they arrived at the tea place, she tried to order a basic raspberry tea, but he stopped her and told Jane that she had to have this special one. He really insisted she only ordered that type of drink. She was weirded out by it, but went along. After, he asked if they could look around Jane's school. It was dark, but the school is well lit, so she agreed. And the whole time they walked around, he would randomly stop and grab her for long hugs. He kept grabbing and breathing hard into her neck. It was so awkward, and she stopped him. He also wouldn't tell any personal details about himself. He even said at one point, I'm a mysterious man. And he also said something like, you look so much like my favorite movie character. And Jane asked who, but he said she would have to figure it out on her own. Finally, he said, I want to go to a dark area. He somehow knew there was a wooded area behind Jane's campus. Jane said no, and that she wanted to stay near the main campus in town, but he kept pushing. Finally, he grabbed her arm and said, I can't let anyone see. Jane ripped her arm away and began to go back to the main road and he followed. He was pleading with Jane to stay. She told him she would message him, lying obviously, saying anything to get him to leave. Suddenly, he leans towards Jane and she thinks he's going to kiss her, but it was so much worse. Instead, she felt pain in her face. It took her a second to realize that he was biting her face. He leaned his head sideways and bit on Jane's nose and cheek as hard as he could. She screamed and pushed him away from her. His face looked so freaky and she barely had time to react in words. Instead, Jane ran up to the sidewalk until she saw a convenience store on the right. She ran to the back of the store and bent down, freaked out. The owner started to yell at her, but she couldn't explain the situation. She just begged him in English to let her stay. After waiting for some time, she realized that Tim didn't end up following her. Jane peered outside the store and didn't see him, and she immediately texted her friend to take her back to the dorm. On the way back, Jane messaged Tim again and basically told him to stay away from her and something along the lines of calling the police if he continued to stalk her. And then she blocked him. She was so thankful that she never let him pick her up at the dorm. Jane also called her mom and told her everything that happened when suddenly she said, wait, what did he ask you? She then put some details together and realized that all these weird things had to do with the 50 shades of gray books. The eye color, the way he dressed, and the tea he made her drink, and the random lines he said, it all matches his little fantasy. It was so creepy, but that was the last time that Jane ever saw Tim again. On a happier note, this bad experience didn't stop Jane. She eventually met someone else in Korea and they ended up falling in love. They even did the whole long distance thing and now she's living in Korea, studying and working. It's been years since this whole strange encounter, but if she ever runs into him again, Tim, you're gonna get your ass kicked. This past Monday, Susan and her co-workers returned to their hotel from a day of working out in the field. 
Rebecca and Susan stood outside their rooms. She opened hers and saw someone in the bathroom. Hello? Nobody answered. Her first instinct was that it was a cleaning lady in there. And then she saw her bag and her clothes in the woman's hand. What are you doing with my stuff? She said. The lady kept mumbling about how her key still worked and that's how she got in. Susan was in shock and the woman was obviously very flustered having been caught mid-robbery. She dropped the bags and fumbled around with her purse and the white plastic bag. By this time, Rebecca was behind her watching all the insanity unfold. The woman was scrambling and walking towards the door and Susan said, What's in the bag? No, no, it's uh, just my things. It's just my things. I'll show you. Susan looked and didn't see anything of hers inside, so she let her leave. She went into her room and it's been ransacked. All of her electronics were still there. Then she went into the bathroom and saw her underwear, her bikini, and clothes shoved into her own bags randomly. Even a passport was shoved in there. Then Susan looked in the drawers and saw that she got into her medication. She ran out the door to go find her. She went down to the laundry room and out to the sides of the hotel and didn't see her anywhere. Susan realized she was never going to find her. So she and her coworker went to the lobby to tell them what happened and then called the police. They went back up to the room to wait and noticed that there was a metal bat near the bed but there's also a flashlight on the end. The police got there and took their statements and looked around the room as well. One thing Susan noticed was that there were bits of drywall in the sink and she pointed it out to the cops, but none of them really knew where it came from. They started looking at the door to see if she pried her way in somehow, but there was nothing. They just kind of went with the idea that she had a spare key or something, even though the hotel front desk was adamant that there's no way that could be. The officer that came called for another because they thought the woman might still be in the vicinity. But after Susan and her co-worker's statements were taken, there was nothing else they could really do, so they left. Susan sat down to finally make some calls to tell people, and as she's on the phone, she's thinking about the drywall in the sink and it still didn't make any sense to her. She goes into the bathroom and looks at the drywall in the mirror close to it. And then it hit her. She got Rebecca to help pull at this mirror on the wall and it turns out it was attached on the top. There was a hole there just big enough for a desperate junkie to squeeze through. She asked if she could call the cops again to let them know what they just found, and her boss said that there were still two cop cars in the parking lot. They both went back up, looked at the hole, and found a pillow, blankets, cigarettes, clothes, and toothbrushes inside. This woman had been living in the wall behind her mirror for god knows how long. She had access to Susan's room at all times, and the crawl space was just big enough for her to squeeze through. They took pictures of the scene and everyone was mind blown that this was actually real. Unsurprisingly, Susan and Rebecca packed up and left immediately. The hole in the walls were from a renovation and the hotel hadn't properly patched them so they just covered it up with mirrors. She could have been hanging out in people's rooms while they were gone. Susan never went back to that hotel, but every time she travels and stays at another, you can bet the first thing she checks are the walls and the mirrors. Morgan was heading to this weekly improv show, but his friend whom he usually went with was out of town. So he posted an open invite on a university Facebook group. Morgan got exactly one response from this random girl, Alice. She came to the show and they hit it off big time. Cue the coffee meetups, the Netflix binges, they started dating. Life was pretty good for a while. Then came the first messages. This man Morgan had never met named Eric was sending angry Facebook DMs detailing why Morgan's not a good boyfriend and that he's hurting Alice and how he just doesn't understand her like Eric does. Morgan was a bit annoyed but mostly confused. He talked to Alice about it. 
but she just hand waved it away. He's a jerk, she said. I don't hang out with him anymore. It wasn't the most satisfying explanation, but aggressively jealous guys aren't exactly an anomaly. So Morgan just blocked him and thought that was the end of it. A few months passed by. Alice had planned to study abroad, so when Morgan came back to school, she was already halfway across the world. It was only a few months, he thought. No big deal. But over those next few months, Morgan would become Facebook acquainted with a myriad of strange individuals. There was Leah. She sent an array of messages justifying Eric's anger, reiterating that Morgan's relationship was unhealthy and toxic, and that Alice and Eric have much better history. She also included a blurry photo of a girl sitting on top and making out with a skinny guy. Both of their faces were obscured, but Leah swore it was Alice and Eric from some time during the summer. There was Nick. His Facebook pic was a guy on a skateboard in front of a sunset. He readily admitted that he had feelings for Alice, but made clear that neither he nor Eric had any right to be upset about her not being with them. He said that Leah and Eric were liars and he tried to set them straight. Relative to the others, he seemed semi-okay, but he let slip a few really bitter sounding messages. There was Hannah. She showed up after Morgan blocked Leah. She claimed to be a childhood friend of Alice. There was Chris. He would send one cryptic message every once in a blue moon. He never replied to any of Morgan's messages. There was Mark. He apologized for the actions of the others. He tried to fill Morgan in on the group's dynamics and history. In the physical absence of Alice, he offered to meet him to talk. They set up a time and place, but he never showed up and Morgan never heard from him again. There was Sarah, there was David, there were so many. This was all spread over a period of time. Morgan usually blocked or stopped hearing from one person before hearing from another. Meanwhile, Alice is extremely difficult to get a hold of. Even when she responds, she's really dismissive of the whole subject. I don't know what to do, she said. And then Morgan gets an accusation. One day Alice sends him the question, who's Mary? Morgan tells her the truth, that he doesn't know who Mary is. She sends screenshots of texts she received from an unknown number. In them, the sender wrote that her name is Mary and that she's in love with Morgan. He told me he loved me, Mary wrote. He slept with me and now he has not called me back. He started to get texts from Mary. She asked why he hadn't called her, if he meant what he said. She said she had seen Morgan on campus, here, there, at this event, at this particular time, and every time she would say a location, he realized that he had actually been at that place at that time. Was he being stalked? Morgan started looking over his shoulder. He didn't know what to do. He had no face and no name to report. He calls Alice and tells her he can't do this anymore. Morgan had no clue what was going on, but he knew somehow that they were all involved and he wanted no part in it. And he cut off all contact with Alice. Then all of a sudden, everything, the messages, the texts, they all stopped. A friend of Morgan realized something soon after. Barely any of Alice's friends had their faces on Facebook. Eric's pic was some photo of a Tumblr blog full of cute nerds. The photo of Chris was an obscure photo of Justin Bieber. The photo of Nick, the skateboarder, was a stock photo. Hannah's photo was art from a book ad. David was apparently a Korean pop singer, and they also noticed something else. All of their photos were created around the same time he met Alice. To this day, Morgan doesn't understand it. Fast forward two years, he gets a text from an unknown number. The number looks familiar, he thinks to himself. And then he realized, it's Alice. The text consists of one word. Sorry, Alice. Well, let's not meet again. On one Sunday afternoon, Macy and Lily decided to go hiking in some hills about an hour away. It wasn't too difficult of a hike, so they reached the top without any problems. After resting for a bit, they decided to head back down. They had been walking for maybe 10 minutes and Macy started complaining and wanted to walk down the side of the road instead of the rough hiking trail. 
Lily conceded, but not even after five minutes, a truck pulled up next to them. It was red and rusty. The guy driving rolled down the window and greeted them, asking if they needed a ride. Macy thought he looked charming and even cute. Lily was hesitant, but despite her better judgment, Macy convinced her to get in the trunk since it must only be a 10-minute drive down to the car, tops. The two girls opened the passenger's door to this rusty old thing and the guy directed them behind the seat to get into the back. They settled in and the truck started rumbling forwards. The back seat was clean enough, but there was a rope on the floor behind the driver's seat and four boxes of saran wrap half hanging out from under the passenger's seat. It seemed creepy and weird, but Lily didn't want to freak Macy out, so she just kept her mouth shut. After 10 minutes, the woods didn't look any clearer, and they hadn't seen another car the whole time. Lily asked how long he thought it would be. He said he was taking a different route down the hill and had to stop somewhere to get something first. Several minutes after, they reached the tiny log cabin. There was an old stump where somebody had been chopping wood and a huge axe was stuck into the log. Lily was definitely on red alert now. The guy turned off the truck and slipped out of it saying, I'll be right back, so don't get out, okay? Lily tried to talk to Macy about how she was incredibly uncomfortable, but she mostly dismissed it. She started begging, increasingly freaked out, and finally put her foot down demanding Macy to exit the truck with her. The house was around 50 yards in front of them and they wandered around looking at it hesitantly. All of a sudden, Macy thought if this guy really was decent and was just trying to give us a ride, it would be super rude to just run off, right? She actually started to head back into the truck, opening the front door to climb in behind the driver's seat. Lily was pissed off and started yelling at Macy telling her to not get in the car. But when she opened the door, she saw it. On the driver's side floor, half hidden under the seat, there was a big hatchet. It had dried red-brown stains covering the blade and stuck to the floor under it. Lily understandably lost her mind seeing it and Macy started getting hysterical. They decided that leaving was by far the best option at this point and ran quickly into the trees. In panic, they went around in the trees for a little while until Lily was fairly confident that they were on their way back down the hill. When they finally got down to the bottom and saw the old wooden fence that surrounded the original parking area, they were relieved. But as they got closer, they saw it. The truck was parked on the other side of the gravely makeshift lot, just sitting there facing the other way innocently. They couldn't see if anyone was in it and of course Macy wanted to run for the car but Lily was super hesitant. This took place when there were no cell phones and there was no ranger station or anyone around. The parking lot was big and empty and open and who knows what would have happened if they decided to stroll across it. Thankfully, Lily convinced Macy to relax and the two hunkered down against a big tree, hidden in the bushes. Waited it out for what seemed to be a couple of hours when dark started to fall. She was just planning their dash to the car when they heard a clunk. They watched as one of the back doors of their car swung open and the bearded guy slid his way out of the back seat. He got out the car, shut the door, looking around the surrounding woods for several moments and then walked back to his truck. Several minutes after watching him drive away, they sprinted to their car as fast as they could, jumped in and peeled out before they had even shut the doors. Joe was working for a call center that provided, among other things, phone services for a 24-hour plumbing company, so they needed someone on the line at all times. Her shift usually ran from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m., and because of budget cuts, she was always the only operator on the floor. The only people in the building at night were herself and the security guy who came to do his rounds. Around 2 a.m. one night, Joe got a call. Hello, you're calling so-and-so. My name is Jill. How may I help you? The guy on the other side repeated her name and hung up. Working the night shift, you get used to a lot of weird stuff, so she shrugged it off and went back to reading her book. Then he called again and asked if he was speaking to Jill. She said yes, repeated the company name, and asked how she may help. He hangs up. The third time around, he asks if this is Joe on the phone, and she asks whom she's speaking to. He hangs up again. The next time he calls, he's breathing hard on the phone and tells her he wants her to talk to him and that he's not going to hurt her. Jill jotted down his number and started hanging up whenever his call popped up. 
This went on for a while. When he realized that she was hanging up every time she saw that number, he began calling from a restricted number, meaning Jill never knew if it was a legit call and ended up answering. This guy keeps saying that he's not going to hurt her. The one time she counted, Jill hung up on this guy over 200 times in one night. She complained to her boss, but she did nothing. Instead, she laughed the whole thing off because the guy obviously didn't know where she was and he was only a voice on the line so she was perfectly safe. Jill started talking to co-workers and here's when it started getting really creepy. He never called on her days off. Indeed, at one point, she changed shifts with a co-worker to attend a wedding and he didn't call that day. They told Jill to file a complaint herself, but she wasn't sure if she could since this wasn't happening on her personal number. None of them could really walk her home since she was the only operator on the night shift. And she got a little paranoid because obviously this guy knew her schedule pretty well. It had to be someone who could see her. Jill started doing commute with her cell phone in hand at all times with the emergency number dialed in. She tried carrying pepper spray and at one point even considered walking around with a box cutter in her purse. That's how afraid Jill was. One day before her shift started, Jill was taking a short break outside the building before going up and she sees the security guy come by. Same fellow who usually did the night shift. She didn't really know him never spoke much to him and only greeted each other when they would come down to the floor. He asked for a light so she gave him her lighter and he told Jill that he'd been fired and he was going home and he went on to tell her that he always got the impression that she was afraid of him since she was never friendly or welcoming. Then he told Jill that he was never going to hurt her and just walked away. She was frozen and lost every drop of blood she had in her. Jill went inside to tell her boss the whole thing and discovered that the guy got fired for disturbing and creeping on other women in other floors, going as far as trying to corner someone in one of the elevators. The complaints piled up and he lost his job. Most of the time, his shifts matched hers, so he would see her come in at 8 p.m. and she left before he did. Joe asked her boss for that phone number again to come forward on this guy and ask the security company if that was his number. But she told Jill that she threw it away. When Jill told her the whole story, the exact words that her boss said was that she found it cute. Then she asked Jill if she was sure it was him because a voice on the phone is different and maybe you got it wrong. Quality Assurance told them that every call was recorded, so Jill demanded recordings. And that's when she found out again, because of budget cuts and whatnot, the night shift was never recorded. So she had no evidence. Good thing was, once the guy was fired, the calls stopped. And Jill decided not to work there for much longer after that. Jen and her husband Dan were at the supermarket when their baby was being especially fussy. He took her for a 10 minute drive to calm her down and came back into the parking lot waiting for Jen to finish shopping for groceries. Dan was taking a business call and sat down absentmindedly rocking the baby when a woman approached them. It's not uncommon for people to ask to play with their baby. She's got big rosy cheeks, soft wisps of gold hair, and the most adorable gursley toothless grin. But her nap schedule was paramount, so he was preparing to tell the woman she actually couldn't play with the baby right then. She walked over, brimming with confidence, and before Dan could even finish his sentence, she picked up the carrier and started walking off. Dan was in shock and said, Excuse me, put her down. She started walking away more briskly. Dan tried to grapple the carrier out of her hands, resulting to restraining her arms. This woman yells, Help! He's trying to take my baby! Kidnapping! 911! Help! Kicking him in the shin and pulling a pink bottle of pepper spray out of her handbag. Unsurprisingly, no one in the parking lot was clocking the earlier interaction and assumed he was really a kidnapper. Immediately, a man knocked Dan to the ground and was holding him down, telling him that the police was being called. He was telling everyone in the parking lot it's his daughter, but no one was listening. I have pictures of the baby on my phone! This, however, didn't translate well. 
because everyone interpreted as him having stalking photos of the baby. It was at this point that another man kicked Dan as hard as he could in the ribs. At this time, Jen came out of the store and she thought he was being robbed by these people. She was yelling for security, panicking. And when she saw that her baby was being held by a woman, she was relieved. Jen thought maybe her daughter was moved out of harm's way whilst her husband was being robbed. She couldn't find a security guard outside the store and so she ran up to the people holding her husband down, waving her wallet, pleading, Take everything you want, just, just leave us alone! The man said, Lady, we need to wait for the police to deal with him. Jen was confused as to why muggers have called the police. What do you mean? What are you talking about? And made out someone saying, He tried to abduct that woman's kid. Her husband would never hurt a child. She kept trying to understand what the man was saying and suddenly, it all clicked. She looked around for the woman who had her baby and she was halfway across the parking lot. Jen went ballistic and sprinted across right to her. All she could think to do was to grab the woman by her hair and squeeze her throat with her other arm. She yanked her hair as hard as she could and that was enough to make her drop the carrier. She was so scared and surprised she threw herself on top and when she looked up, the woman left. Not one person tried to stop her and within the next couple minutes, police had arrived. There were still several bystanders who explained it as her husband trying to kidnap the baby. The police's first questions when asking for her description weren't investigative. They were questions thinly veiled trying to convince Jen not to pursue charges, still placing blame on her husband. Do your husband and the baby look dissimilar? Is there a chance she thought he was abducting the baby and she was trying to intervene? Could your husband have been doing something inappropriate or violent to the baby that would make her feel compelled to extricate the baby from the situation? Did she seem groggy or confused? Could she have mistaken either of them for her own family members? They spent more time verifying that the baby was actually Jen's instead of focusing on the kidnapper. Her husband had caught his brother at that point who works in an office with a lot of lawyers and connected with one ASAP. And they gave him the priceless advice to get every officer's name and badge number, to request copies of the store's security tapes right away, and to escalate the complaint higher up the chain if these officers weren't taking them seriously. Finally. Jen and Dan had enough reason to believe they were being taken seriously, and they went home. Dan was seething with rage and grappling with a feeling of helplessness from how little he was able to do, and has two cracked ribs from when the man kicked him. There were still people who stuck around to talk to the police who were giving the husband dirty looks, and one man even implored the police to involve CPS to verify that it was really their baby. So to the parking lot kidnapper and the parking lot skeptics, they better hope that Jen and Dan never sees them again. When Lucy turned 13, she moved with her father to Japan from Colombia due to his job. They arrived to Shizuoka Prefecture and rented a small house to live in. Her dad did research work at one of the universities while Lucy attended a school at Shizuoka closest to their home. During the first week, her dad was able to drive Lucy to school and also to pick her up after. Things were going fine. She started to make new friends, her Japanese was improving, and overall had a great time. But then, Lucy's dad started to work more hours and in order to spend the weekends with her, he decided to change his routine, meaning he wouldn't be able to drive her or pick her up from school anymore. Lucy had no problem being on her own and she reassured him that everything was going to be okay. The first two weeks walking alone was perfectly fine. Until the Tuesday of the third week. Lucy was on her usual route to school, and then a man around his 30s approached her with a kind smile on his face. He greeted her in English and started to say things such as, It's a nice day, I should have brought my dog, and I remember I used to take this way to school. Lucy tried to be polite since it was common to have people from the area approaching her and her dad for small talk. And since Japanese people are so kind and polite, she did the same as well. She told this man that she really needed to hurry for school. He looked at her, 
quite disappointed, but smiled again and said, "Oh, sure, you must be a really good student. Always on time. I hope to see you again." The next day, she saw him again. This time, he told her that he actually had seen Lucy and her dad since they arrived, and how he noticed that her dad was no longer driving her to school. He then handed her a plastic bag full of candies and cookies. After that, he finally let her go. In the bag, there were also notes that said, "Have a nice day at school. You are smart. You are pretty." The following day, Lucy decided to confront him. Before he offered one of his gifts, she stopped him and told him he made her uncomfortable and to stop being around her. And all of a sudden, he snapped, and the man started yelling at Lucy, saying she's ungrateful, that she was mistaking their friendship. He pretended to be hurt, and Lucy fell for it. I should have told my father before, Lucy said. I should have told him everything. Initially, she felt embarrassed and wanted to resolve the problem by herself. One day, her class had a school trip to the Aokigahara Forest. The trip was going well. They were walking near the area of the forest and the surroundings, and were divided by groups of ten with one teacher at the head. It was going to be a long walk, so everyone was told to go to the restroom beforehand. Each of the students were wearing identification, and when they came back, Lucy suddenly realized that she lost hers and thought to run back to the restroom to check and see if she dropped it just before her teacher would notice and scold her for losing it. After checking the restroom and not finding her ID, she decided to give up and get back to her group. But then, the guy appeared again. He greeted Lucy and then asked, "What are you doing here?" Feeling shocked and freaked out to see him, Lucy told him that she was in a school trip and that she needed to hurry up and get back to find her group. But before she could get away from him, he said, "Don't you need your ID?" Lucy froze. She looked back at him, and he smiled. Then said, "I found it on the ground. I recognized your pretty face, so I put it in my car. Let's go get it before you get in trouble." At this point, Lucy was terrified. He started to look more sinister, and she couldn't say anything. Seeing she wasn't responding, the man grabbed her arm and began to pull her. Lucy snapped and freed from his grip and started to run away. He followed behind, running fast while calling out, "Lucy Chan, Lucy Chan, what are you doing? Come back here!" She continued running. She didn't realize that she entered the forest and was now without direction. After running for who knows how long, she no longer heard the man's voice. Her whole body felt heavy, and Lucy couldn't catch her breath. She looked around, and everything. Seemed the same. There was silence. She continued walking for a while until she came across a tending camp. Lucy felt relief when she saw a man come out. She proceeded to tell him everything that happened. He seemed confused and a bit scared of her. But after seeing Lucy crying, he changed his expression to a more warming one. He listened to everything quietly until she finished. They both agreed to call the cops and alert the authorities of the place. Thankfully, he knew the way back to the entrance of the forest, and two of the forest keepers were walking there. His name is Yuki, and Yuki told them in Japanese everything that Lucy had told him. The forest keepers brought them to an information area where they called the police and told them to wait there. They also sent other forest keepers to look for the classmates and alert them about the guy. Meanwhile, Yuki tried to comfort Lucy, telling her what he was doing in the woods. He said that his younger brother passed away five years ago, and since then he's been going to the forest on his brother's birthday to honor him. When the police arrived, she told the officer everything that happened while another group of police officers searched the area. They finally found the guy in the forest. They arrested him and searched his car for evidence and found tape, rope. And a knife. She thanked Yuki for saving her life, and shortly after, the trip ended, and the school called her father. He immediately rushed to the school, but he didn't scold Lucy that day. He just hugged her, and she cried on his shoulder.
Harry's best friend Mari is an Instagram influencer. Not big time, but big enough to get free stuff and has gotten two sponsored trips. One day, a boutique hotel from Miami contacted her via Instagram DMs and offered her an all-expenses-paid trip to Miami for Memorial Weekend, in exchange for her to be in a hotel and take pics and do a couple of stories. She was told she could bring a female friend with her if she wanted to and everything would be covered for. This was her first time doing this, so at the time, she wasn't really sure of how it worked. The company sent her a contract for her to sign, and it said she'd be responsible for paying for her plane ticket to Miami, and that she would be reimbursed for it later. This was to prevent a no-show, meaning the influencer gets the ticket purchased by the hotel and the influencer never shows up. So it seemed reasonable. She invited Harry instead of a female friend because she was nervous about the whole thing, and they figured it wouldn't be a big deal. Worst case scenario, they don't pay for Harry's plane ticket, but they can cover it for themselves. Mari then signed the contract and everything was set to go. On the day of the trip, they arrived to Miami safely. Harry and Mari were supposed to be picked up by the hotel at the airport. They walked around the terminal and that's when Mari saw a guy holding a sign with her last name and the paper has the hotel logo. They were greeted and then escorted to a black SUV. Here is where it gets weird. As soon as they got into the car, they noticed that the driver is visibly upset. Harry and Mari thought he was talking to the guy who walked them over, but he was talking to Mari. He had a very thick accent and was wearing dark shades. He was telling Mari that she was not allowed to bring her boyfriend and that she said it was two girls. Two girls. Hotel told me. Two girls. No one guy. One girl. Two girls. He was demanding to see where the other girl was. They were speechless and confused. The guy who walked them to the car looked annoyed. He got into the passenger seat and started to fight with the driver in Portuguese. Then he turns to them and asks where the other girl is at. Mari, feeling very upset by now, tells them that there is no other girl, that she is Mari and Harry is just a friend coming with her on a trip. The guy in the driver's seat gets out, tosses their luggage out of the car and says, This is some bullshit! He gets in the car and immediately, they take off. And that was it. Harry and Mari were in complete shock. She immediately emails Melissa, the PR person they have been in contact with this entire time, to tell her what happened. No response. They decided to take a cab and show up to the hotel. And when they finally got there, everything made sense. The hotel had been rebranded and had a completely different name, owner, and staff. Harry showed them the hotel's Instagram profile, and indeed, that was the hotel it used to be but not the new one. This hotel never contacted them. They never did anything. Whoever was in charge of the old IG account of the old hotel did, or whoever got a hold of it did. And mind you, this was a somewhat big hotel account with over 10,000 followers. It was real. But upon further inspection, Harry and Mari realized that the pictures were really old and so were the posts. Mari felt like an idiot and couldn't believe that they actually got into this situation. They called the police, met up with the detective, but nothing ever came out of it. They investigated who was running the account before or who had access to it. However, none of the people who used to run the account had anything to do with it. Nothing ever came out of this. When Ray was 11 years old, her parents had to go to an emergency trip to her grandparents' house, but she had school and basketball practice in the mornings, so she couldn't go. Their house alarm was broken, so Ray's dad told her where his hidden pistol was and made sure she knew to call 911 if something were to occur and to immediately call him after. Ray's dad had always been somewhat paranoid, but their house was in a suburban area that wasn't known to have crime, so she didn't think too much of it. Her parents left after work on Friday. 
Everything was fine all night and all day Saturday. Ray's bedtime was usually around 11 p.m., but because she had the whole house to herself, she stayed up until around 2 a.m. before she got tired and finally went to bed. It had only been an hour or so since falling asleep when suddenly, Ray heard a random loud pop from outside her room. The sound was from the front door. Ray didn't think too much of it at first because on windy nights, there were times when the door would be pushed just slightly and it would make that sound. But there was no wind. Even still, she wasn't very worried. There was again, followed by a bunch of quiet clicking noises. Ray started getting annoyed thinking that it was the neighborhood stoner kids just messing around in the middle of the night which they were known for doing so, so she got out of bed and went outside the room. Her bedroom door has a loud pop to it when opened, louder than the front door and it can be heard throughout the entire house. Suddenly, the clinking noises stopped, but Ray still felt the need to check it out. There were high shrubs outside her bedroom window, so she couldn't really see outside very well. She went out to the living room and peered through the blinds and choked up when she noticed the hooded figure peek over from the side of the entrance. Someone was trying to pick the lock and break into her house. Ray's mind was racing. He had to have noticed the blinds move, but maybe he ran off. Ray held her breath for a moment and stayed completely still. Not even a minute later, the clinking returned, but more furiously. This psycho was still trying to break in. In her panicked state, she didn't think about calling the police or her dad. A sudden rage came over Ray, and she just wanted to get rid of this guy. She grabbed a can of hairspray in her bathroom, and because of Ray's love for candles, Ray had a lighter in her room as well. She raced back to the door and in one swift motion, unlocked it, yanking it open and lit that burglar up while screaming at the top of her lungs. She couldn't see the guy well in the darkness and past the flame, but Ray heard a loud scream of anguish. It didn't take long for the neighbors to hear her and turn on their porch lights, which is when she suddenly collected herself and let go of the lighter switch. But when she opened her eyes, there was no one there. The guy quickly ran out of there, and Ray's neighbors had come outside in a light panic and called the police. Her parents were also called, and she explained to them and the police what had happened. But unfortunately, because it was so dark, she couldn't identify him. Ray's mom was freaking out about it, but her dad said he was proud and told her to get some sleep after everything. But that was impossible. She stayed up the entire night thinking about it. The next day, Ray got a call from her parents saying that the officers had caught the guy. Patrol car had noticed someone smoking in a nearby park under the playground and the officers approached the suspect. Assuming it was one of the stoner kids, they expected him to run. But to their surprise, he approached them and was begging for help. They saw that his entire arm was burnt to a crisp and when they searched his backpack, they found enough evidence to arrest the guy. And thankfully, he never returned. In the late 1960s, my great uncle John was traveling by train from his village to another to visit family. He had to change trains at one point and was dropped off at what amounted to a platform and a hut in the middle of nowhere. There was no one at the station, and other than a dirt road that led off into the surrounding woods, there was nothing there. He waited for some time, but no train came. It was winter and getting colder and darker, and just about the time he started worrying about a place to stay and some food to eat, an old woman appeared out of the twilight. She asked if he was waiting for a train, and when he said he was, she said it wouldn't be along until the following day. She asked if he needed a bed for the night, and offered him a meal and a room at her house. He was glad to accept her offer and stay out of the cold. He took his suitcase and they set off together down the dark road into the forest. It was more than an hour away and by the time they arrived at the woman's small two-story house, John was tired and hungry. They went inside and the woman lit some oil lamps and warmed some borscht for them. John finished his soup and asked where he would be sleeping. 
She led him up to the stairs to a tiny room with a window that contained a single bed and nothing else. He thanked her. They said goodnight and she closed the door. Then she locked it, leaving him in the dark. Somewhat creeped out by this, John called to her. But she didn't answer and he heard nothing else. Figuring he would deal with it in the morning and that she had probably done it by mistake, John set his suitcase down and laid on the bed. Before he could fall asleep though, he felt the urge to pee and got out of bed hoping to find a chamber pot or something he could pee in. He got onto his hands and knees and began to feel under the bed in the darkness, thinking that's where the pot would be if there was one. He found the body. John went right to the window to see if he could exit the room that way. It was nailed shut. He knew that if he remained in the room, he was probably a dead man. But if he broke the window and tried to get out of the way, there was a good chance that the old woman would hear him and come into the room before he could get away. So he did the only thing he could do. He pulled the body from under the bed, heaved it onto the mattress, and covered it with the blanket. Then he got under the bed and waited. Sure enough, about an hour later, he heard footsteps coming slowly up the stairs and then toward the room. The lock clicked and the knob turned slowly. In the gloom, John saw someone moving toward the bed. Then he heard several sickening thuds. The person had bashed the body on the bed with a large crowbar, which then dropped onto the floor right in front of John. There was silence. Then the person went out the room and the door was shut again. John moved from under the bed and took the crowbar and was able to slowly pry the window open. When the window was up, he threw his suitcase out and dove through himself, not caring what was below him, only worried about what was behind. He landed without too much injury and began to run into a field behind the house towards some light in the far distance. It turned out to be a highway with some military and transport trucks on it, and luckily John was able to get a ride to another village where he could catch a train. He didn't bother reporting what had happened to the authorities, since at that time in the USSR, there was a distinct chance he would have been the one who got into trouble. He just thanked God he had escaped and decided that the next time he traveled to visit relatives, he would take another way. My brother's girlfriend Amanda was looking for her first apartment when she decided to move out of her parents' house. She and my brother didn't want to move in together since they had only dated for a few months, so Amanda opted to search for a roommate online. Browsing Craigslist, she found an ad titled, Roommate Wanted, Females Only. This sort of thing was common since the area she was looking in was mostly young professionals. The listing was for a room in a house that was quite cheap compared to the many places listed. The occupant listed herself as a 23-year-old student that wasn't comfortable with living with any males. The other roommate would have their own room and attached bathroom. So far, Amanda was into this place. However, the listing only had a single photo from outside the property. Amanda sent an email wanting to meet the occupant and tour the house. Within 30 minutes, she receives an email back with all the details and time to stop by. The girl worked late hours and wanted Amanda to stop by at 8pm. When Amanda arrives, there's a handwritten note on the front door saying, Door broken. Use back door. Walking around the house, it looks nice but slightly unkempt. Tall grass, weeds, dusty windows, etc. When she knocks on the back door, an older man opens it. At first, Amanda thinks she has the wrong house, but the man reassures her and says the occupant was out and he was the landlord. The occupant asked him to meet Amanda since she was working late. Alarms start going off, but aren't at red alert yet. First, the guy was clearly in his 40s, unshaven, and looked like he lived in his car. Also, only the kitchen light was on. As they walked around the house, Amanda noticed one huge red flag. No furniture. Nothing. The landlord was polite about answering questions, but seemed irritable to keeping lights on for too long, rushing her around and only letting her look at rooms for a few moments. There was a single room that the landlord wouldn't open. 
telling her that it was the occupant's room and he didn't want to invade her privacy. As they walk down the hallway, she notices the front door has a plank nailed across it, broken for sure. Amanda's creep meter is starting to ding, so she decides to wrap up the house tour and leave, but tries to be polite. He perks up and states that he forgot to show her the basement. It's recently furnished and would be a great recreation room. So he opens it. The basement is pitch black. He smiles, motions down the stairs, and says, Ladies first. What happens next is nothing more than a stroke of luck. Amanda gets a text just as some random person parks in front of the house. Thinking on her feet, she pretends it's a phone call and answers her phone. Hey, yeah, are you here? I'll come out from around back and let you in. It's great, you have to see it. With a motion of confidence, she excuses herself around the landlord and walks out the back door. The guy just looked at her and he was confused. Once outside, she quickly sprinted to her car and sped out of there. When Amanda got home, she told her mother and my brother everything. Cops were called, they took her statement and went to investigate. The Craigslist post had been removed. The house had been foreclosed over six months earlier and the property had been abandoned. When the police investigated, they found that the closed room the landlord didn't want her to look in was where the man had been staying. There was a pile of old dirty blankets, rotten food, and empty gallon jugs everywhere. The more creepy thing was he had plastered ripped up pages from provocative magazines on all the walls in the room. And the scariest part of this was the basement. The man had tied a piece of fishing twine at about shin level across the stairs about halfway down. The basement was empty except another old pile of blankets, a broom handle wrapped in leather belts, and a small box with a few rows of assorted tapes. Needless to say, Amanda never ended up moving in, and she hopes she never meets that man ever again. About five years ago, I lived downtown in a major city in the US. I've always been a night person, so I would often find myself bored after my roommate went to sleep. To pass the time, I used to go for long walks and spent the time thinking. The park, as it was most nights, was completely empty. I turned down a short side street in order to loop back to my apartment when I first noticed him. At the far end of the street on my side was the silhouette of a man dancing. It was a strange dance, similar to a waltz. Deciding he was probably drunk, I stepped as close as I could to the road to give him the majority of the sidewalk to pass me by. He was very tall and lanky and wearing an old suit. He danced closer until I could make out his face. His eyes were open and wild, head tilted back, looking off at the sky. His mouth was formed in a painfully wide cartoon of a smile. I decided to cross the street before he could get any closer. As I reached the other side, I glanced back and then saw him dead in my tracks. He had stopped dancing and was standing with one foot in the street perfectly parallel to me. He was facing me, but still looking skyward smile still wide on his lips. I was completely and utterly unnerved by this. I started walking again. He didn't move. The street and sidewalk ahead were completely empty. Still unnerved, I looked back to where he had been standing to find him gone. For the briefest of moments, I felt relieved until I noticed him. He had crossed the street and was now slightly crouched down. I couldn't tell for sure due to the distance and the shadows, but I was certain he was facing me. I was so shocked that I stood there for some time, staring at him. And then he started moving towards me again. He took giant, exaggerated, tiptoed steps as if he were a cartoon character sneaking up on someone. I like to say at this point I ran away or pulled out my pepper spray or my cell phone or anything at all. But I didn't. I just stood there completely frozen as the smiling man crept towards me, still smiling, still looking at the sky. When I finally found my voice, I blurted out the first thing that came to mind. What I meant to say was, Hey, what do you want? What came out was a whimper. What, what do you... 
Regardless of whether or not humans can smell fear, they can certainly hear it. I heard it in my own voice, and that only made me more afraid. But he didn't react to it at all. He just stood there, smiling. And then, after what felt like forever, he turned around very slowly and started dance walking away. Just like that, not wanting to turn back to him again, I just watched him go until he was enough away to almost be out of sight. And then I realized something. He wasn't moving away anymore, nor was he dancing. I watched in horror as the distant shape of him grew larger and larger, and this time he was running straight towards me. I ran until I was off the side road and back into a better lit road with sparse traffic. Looking behind me then, he was nowhere to be found. The rest of the way home, I kept glancing over my shoulder, always expecting to see his terrifying smile, but he was never there. I lived in that city for six more months after that night, and I never went out for another walk. There was something about his face that always haunted me. He didn't look drunk. He didn't look high. He looked completely and utterly insane. And that's a very very scary thing to see. It was the weekend on Saturday evening. Kayla's parents had to go to England for a meeting so they told her to stay home by herself, but before they left they installed a good security system in the house. At around 5.30pm the next day, she received an email from her dad saying that he had transferred money to the bank and wanted Kayla to withdraw it. She sighed in frustration but had to go to the ATM before it got dark because it could be dangerous. She started off walking the usual 5 minute distance and arrived at the ATM. She noticed a man leaning on the light post to the right of it. He was facing down and was completely shirtless with long black trousers on. Kayla was confused and many questions were running in her head. Why is he looking down and why is he shirtless on a cold November's evening? She quickly withdrew the cash and got out immediately. Kayla turned around to see if the man was still standing there, but he was gone. She sighed in relief, thinking that he had already left. She turned her head and suddenly the man was standing in front of her. Kayla nearly screamed in terror with her heart pounding faster than it ever has and he was staring at her with soulless cold eyes and a creepy smile on his face. She dared not to open her mouth to ask what was wrong with him. Instead, Kayla took that opportunity to run as fast as she could and pass him by. She ran a good distance away and glanced over her shoulder to see if he was following her. But for some reason, he didn't move from that spot. In less than three minutes, she reached her house. Kayla then checked her security cameras to see if that man followed her home, and luckily, he didn't. Feeling paranoid, she decided to sleep on the couch that night near the recording TV. The next morning, Kayla woke up early to go for a run at a nearby park. She was walking into the deeper area of the park where there were no people ahead of her. But then she noticed that somebody was following her. She just thought it might be a regular person walking in the park. So she plugged in her earphones, turned on the music, and continued running. A few seconds later, she felt the ground vibrate with heavy steps of a man. Then suddenly, the man wrapped his arms around Kayla's waist. Kayla screamed and he remained silent and let go of his left arm from her waist and covered her mouth. She bit his hand until his skin broke and bled. He was screaming in agonizing pain but was not so foolish to free her from his locked right arm. She immediately turned around to face him and that's when she saw that it was the same guy from yesterday at the ATM. He lowered his face closer to Kayla and said, I've never seen such a beautiful girl like you from my whole neighborhood. Kayla was so freaked out in panic trying to resist but the guy wouldn't let go of her. By some miracle, two security guards approached him from behind and knocked him down to his feet, handcuffed him and took him to the police. Kayla asked the security guards how they knew she was in danger. He said that the security team fixed hidden cameras on trees and light posts for visitor safety three days ago after there were reports that young teenage girls go missing in this park. Kayla thanked the security guard after saving her life, and he told her not to travel places anymore without an adult. After 15 minutes, the police arrived at the scene and they asked Kayla for details and how it all started. Kayla then called her dad and told him about the incident. The police gave her a ride home and said they would give her an update on the situation. She thanked them for the help and left. Two days passed. Kayla got a call from the police and they said that they collected all the information and details about the man. He fled from his country and admitted to many felonies and will be sent back to receive his punishments and the death sentence.
It was 6.40 a.m. on a school day and I was on the stop waiting for my bus to arrive. I've always been a cautious person and I constantly looked around. As I turned to my left, I see a man. I was kind of creeped out because of how tall he was and I couldn't see his face. However, it was probably just another guy waiting for the bus, so I shrugged it off. I looked again and he was standing still. This confused me as I didn't know which way he was staring. And then I looked one more time and the man is sprinting full speed towards me. He stopped right in front of me and said, Oh, I thought I was late for this bus. No, you're not, I said calmly and got to take a look at his face. He looked like he was around his 40s. Brown hair, messy beard, torn up clothes. We waited at the stop for another 10 minutes and the bus was finally arriving. I stuck my arm out just to make sure the bus driver could see me. As soon as I walked up, I felt the man grab my shoulder and pull me back very hard. I instantly started to panic as both of us are now hid in the darkness of the bus stop. What are you doing? I said in a scared voice. It was still dark out and the bus driver obviously didn't see me with the headlights on and the rain pouring. It was at that moment I realized I was in a dark street with a creepy man putting his hands on me, probably making a horrifying face. Slowly, I looked behind my shoulder and the last thing I remembered was him hitting me in the head and knocking me out unconscious. <sighs> I saw the man sleeping in a bed to my right. The adrenaline was rushing through me and all I could think about was how I could escape. I've had some training in MMA so I didn't feel too unconfident if I needed to fight for my life. Since the guy was still asleep, I was planning on elbowing him repeatedly in the head while he was still sleeping and then find a way out. I knew this would work if I could do it correctly, so I propped up and walked to his bed. I got my arm ready and instantly he turns his head and sees me above him. I tried to hit him as hard as I could, however with the fear at that moment, I missed. Again, I started swinging as hard and as fast as possible, but to my surprise, the man didn't block any of my fists at all. He just laid there smiling as his head got pounded. Honestly, it freaked me out even more that he wasn't doing anything. But finally, his face gave in. His nose started to bleed and a cut began to emerge on his face. I started to slow down as I ran out of stamina. His eyes closed and the smile began to fade. Instead of taking a step back, I decided to keep going and kept swinging as hard as I could. I was sure the man was out cold. The man's eyes opened and he smiled and stood up. I saw a window to my left and without hesitation, I quickly ran and jumped out of it. I landed on top of a bin. His apartment was only two stories high, so it didn't hurt too much. It turns out it wasn't long after he kidnapped me as it was still dark. I ran away and luckily I got back to my home safely. When I got home, I realized there was still blood over my hand. I felt my head and there was blood from when he hit me as well. As I rang my doorbell, I heard my dad's footsteps, followed by heavy footsteps to my left. The man followed me and was suddenly there coming towards me. My dad opened the door and I ran straight inside the house and locked it immediately. I explained everything to him. My dad being the guy he is, swings the door open, fists clenched with me following. As we went outside and looked around, the man reappeared. I went towards him with brass knuckles on, but my father stopped me and muttered, Hand. I looked at the man's hand to see a knife and he starts to slice the air. He gets closer and continues to swing the knife maniacally but manages to barely slice my cheek. My dad grabs him by the arm and beats him senseless. We then caught the police and the man was locked up. Ever since that day, I've become an even more cautious of a person. It took me a while to get over the fear of that day and that's why I no longer ride on the bus.